Centuries ago, the prophet Jeremiah looked at the condition of the people of God and of the world around him, and his heart was grieved and broken. He wanted to give up, he wanted to quit. He just wanted to, just to say to himself, there's no hope, but there was something inside of him. He called it a fire shut up in his bones, and that fire caused him to stand up and preach the gospel, to preach it with truth. And we are calling on pastors today to be united for spiritual awakening and revival and a move of God across our land today. That's why World Challenge, myself and others, are doing these pastors' conferences, two national pastors' conferences next year, to call pastors to put that fire back in their soul, that fresh wind, that fresh fire, that fresh passion. We'll be in San Diego in February and in New York City at Times Square Church. My dear friends, Pastor Carter Conlon, Pastor Tim Delina, Claude Oud, Ron Brown, R.T. Kendall, John Bailey, and many others will be teaching, preaching with great worship leaders. So join us in February or in August, San Diego, New York. Hi, Gary Wilkerson here. Welcome to the Gary Wilkerson Podcast. Thrilled to have you with us today. Today I'm interviewing R.T. Kendall, a wonderful pastor, wonderful interview about preaching with power. And uh, if, if any man can speak to this issue, it's R.T. Kendall. We want to welcome you to this episode. I know you're going to enjoy it. It's not just for pastors. It's uh, for those who pray for pastors who believe for uh, God to move mightily in churches today, uh, for those who want to see a spiritual awakening in America and around the world. Uh, watch this because this is something we can all believe for together. Gary Wilkerson here. Uh, what a privilege it is today uh, to sit here in my study uh, and have on the other end of this line, uh, Dr. R.T. Kendall, a great and amazing man of God, a wonderful pastor, a brilliant writer, a scholar, and just a, it's a tender heart. I, I've only known him for 10 minutes and I'm already just, uh, just blessed. But let me give you a little introduction. Uh, uh, he's author of a, 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 good, a large number of books. Uh, a number of them are uh, some of them are uh, Total Forgiveness, which is a book that uh, some good friends of mine and I have uh, just been so blessed by. Holy Fire, which is powerful. Um, I think my favorite title, RT, is uh, Is Your God Too Nice? Uh, that's a, that looks like a powerful book. And uh, you have a, your doctorate from Oxford University and a Doctor of Divinity as well added to that and pastored uh, uh, Westminster Chapel from 1977 to year 2002 and uh, followed in the footsteps of, I have on my bookshelf here, uh, not only uh, your books, but uh, uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I have uh, G. Campbell Morgan's book on studies of the four gospels. Uh, so that one church uh, really has uh, impacted the world, and you were certainly uh, integral to that. So, so uh, R.T., you're kind enough to let me call you R.T., uh, Dr. Kendall, R.T., uh, thank you for joining us today uh, to follow up on your sermon you did for us about preaching with power. Thank you for taking time with us today. Really, oh, When they gave me that subject, I think, whoever would dare speak on that subject? Wow. You know, I mean, who, who would ever? But I, they gave me that, but I just want to make clear. Wow. I the want to side, learn how. I, I felt like a fraud trying to speak on it. Wow. No, that's, that's how you started the sermon. You know, and I, I, th I found that very interesting that, you know, I, I'll be blunt with you. I, I, you know, at first I wondered, cause I don't know you. I thought, is that just kind of like being nice and kind? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was my act. yeah. Did yeah. it work? Did I convince you how humble <laughs> I was? No, cause it was so powerful. You, you mentioned you only had one or two powerful sermons and I thought, well, the one I'm listening to is powerful. So I know there's at least three. Um, but, but that caught me by surprise that so, so I, I still can't comprehend that, that in all your years of preaching, you really honestly believe you've only preached two, three, maybe powerful sermons or would, and what would you call the other ones if they weren't powerful? I honestly don't know how to answer that. What, what I meant is when I preached and felt I preached with what I've always wanted. Right. And that only happened one or two times. Now I would love to think that, Hundreds of others were, well, let's, you know, Moses didn't know his face shone, did he? And, and I'd like to think that maybe there were many where I did good and preached well, and I would never know. Maybe that's why God wouldn't let me feel that I did well, unless I start taking myself too seriously. But to have that sense of power, uh, it happened once or twice, and that's 
I mean, I'm, maybe I've got too high a standard. Maybe I'm being too hard on myself, but I was trying to be as honest as I knew how. Yeah. What would you, what, what would you say is the difference between the, those, those times where you sensed you were really preaching with power and other times where you're preaching biblically? So, you know, there's, there's certainly power in preaching. You know, the gospel itself has power, uh, but you're talking about something. I, I think when we ask you to preach on preaching with power, we weren't necessarily asking you to say, like, when were those times where, you know, your face shone or everybody in the crowd fell down, but just where you just knew, uh, you know, what it is to have the power of God, whether it be through Scripture or through uh, the Spirit's anointing or just the grace of common grace. Like, um, so what, what do you expect when you say power in your preaching as opposed to something less than that? I don't know. Uh... I think that's the only time in my life I've been asked to speak on that subject. And I felt very self-conscious about it. It's what I've always wanted to do. And I thought, here I am. <laughs> I'm speaking on it as if I've, I know. And I'm going by how I felt. Yeah. I, mean, I, I will accept that maybe I have a too high a standard. That I accept that I might have. because, And the reason I can say that with integrity I did have many people converted under my ministry. Right. I, I do know that. I baptized a lot of people. And therefore, I would conclude my sermons were okay. But I'm talking about the consciousness of having that power. And that just, I always felt I could do better. Mm. I always felt I could do better. And uh, I never... Well, that's, that's the best way I know to put it. I'm not trying to sound humble, and no. maybe I will look back and think, oh, I was just being too hard on myself, or I was putting a standard up that's unrealistic. Maybe that's true. It's hard to say. Right, right. The, um, you, you, in your talk, you also touched on um, when you wanted to use another word for power. I think you went to the word anointing, um, that there was an anointing you know, we know there's an anointing of the preaching of the power of the cross, the demonstration of power that comes from that. So can you take a few minutes to, to share a little bit more about what you believe uh, the, the anointing is and how can a man or woman get it when they want to preach with anointing? Well, the word anointing is only twice in the Bible. Hmm. And that's 1 John 2, verses 20, 27. Um, you have uh, utterance in Ephesians 6. I think that's an equivalent. Uh, you have uh, confidence, boldness. Peter, you know, on the day of Pentecost, he, he, he had boldness. So maybe that's it. Uh, it's fearlessness, hmm. where you don't care whether they like it or not, and whether they're going to clap their hands and applaud and say, oh, that's wonderful. You just go for the truth and you know, you don't know whether they're going to like it. I think that's part of it. Uh, and if you're true to the word, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to apply it. You see, the, the mistake, let me put it this way. I come from the hills of Kentucky. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but uh, have you ever heard of the Cane Ridge Revival? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that my church in Ashland, Kentucky, which is about 100 miles away from Cane Ridge, was possibly the last little bit of the Cane Ridge revival. And you can you can tell what it must have been like. Um, for one thing, they were uneducated people. Another thing, they would shout when they preached. And so I grew up hearing preachers shout, and one tended to equate loud preaching with the anointing. And I think I thought that in my very earliest ministry. I think I thought that. And uh, I came to see that that's not it. Uh, in fact, have you, ever, have you ever heard anybody preach where they lose their breath after each sentence? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, do you know what that is? That's, that's, I think, here's what I, I think on the original Cane Ridge, 
when th- th- there was this, uh, these preachers, they had the, the power of God on them. There's no doubt. And it was so real that they could, they could barely take their breath as they preached. That's how real it was. Yeah. But the trouble was when the anointing left, there were people wanted to show they still had it. Mm. And I could do it for you right now. Do you want me to do it? You want me to give you a, oh, yeah. for God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son <laughs> that whoever believed in him <laughs> should not perish. <laughs> wow. they, that they really thought. And so people who didn't know the difference, when they would hear that kind of preaching, they'd say, oh, yeah, that's the real thing. Mm. And, and in Wales, in, in, in Britain, there's a word called Hoyle, H-O-Y-L-E. That would be the Welsh equivalent of where you had a certain sound. And if you had that sound, people thought that was the anointing. Well, the truth is you, you can put it on, and that's not God. And uh, so I just refuse to do that. Mm. Now, I, I, you, you can raise your voice and, and make you, maybe, maybe there are times you should raise your voice. But uh, the, the key is just to be natural and, and not try to impress them. And um, I think people will recognize honesty and integrity rather than trying to put on a show. Wow, that's powerful. I, I, that, was, that was a great uh, impression, too, of that. Uh, oh, I, I, listen, I forgot to tell you, but I charge for that. <laughs> so, I could have to send you a bill. Okay. Uh, you, you do but that. that no, that's the way they do it. Oh, yeah. I've, I've oh, heard and I'll tell you, there are those still today that do that. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've come across them. Yeah. I can take you to a place in Ashland, Kentucky, where we can go in and slip in, don't let them know you're coming. You can hear that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, you know, I think if a man is generally, like if he, if he is passionate about other things and he talks like that, then when he gets in the pulpit, it makes sense. But I've always had a hard time with, you know, you're talking to somebody backstage and they're talking like we're talking here today. And then all of a sudden they get in the pulpit, they start screaming and yelling and, and, and putting on. And I'm going like, well, uh, that doesn't seem like his personality, you know, where I've met other men who had that very forceful, every time they talked, they were charging the troops ahead. And, you know, so when they got in the pulpit, it was very natural for them to, to be more commanding in that sense. But, uh, you know, the opposite is uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, who they said was kind of quiet and just read his manuscripts. Yeah. And yeah. That's yeah. Pretty- Apparently he w- had a poor delivery. And I'll tell you who else, in my opinion, when we get to heaven, and get a video replay. You want me to tell you who had a poor delivery? The Apostle Paul. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm sure of it. He talks about it. He, yeah. his, way, his letters are weighty, but when when he spoke, it just did. Uh, you know. And there are a lot of uh, people today. Did you know? You ever hear J.I. Packer preach? I have only on uh, uh, on YouTube. Well, I mean, he's not a powerful preacher, is he? No, no better you know, writer have, than... Have you ever heard of F.F. F. Bruce? I've heard of him, but not, never heard well, of him. I, they tell me he was dry as dust. Wow. So there were people like that. Uh, and uh, Pe- I knew Packer quite well, actually. And uh, But his... Uh, I had him preach for me in Indiana and in England and Westminster Chapel. And he was not... Certainly no orator. Yeah. It's strange how some people seem to be, you know, we used that word anointing before, and some people seem to be anointed more in the pulpit, and some people seem to be more anointed in their book the, as they write their books. They, they, you know, like certainly Knowing God by Packer is is an anointed book. Uh, powerful. That's right. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I agree with you. That's, I guess God just gives gifts as he wills, I suppose. Yeah, yeah you got to, and you got to live with your gift. Yeah. Yeah. To do, do, do it. Um, Speaking of, of great writers and preachers, we, we on our team here have been reading um, A.W. Tozer's books about the knowledge of the holy. And he talks in there about uh, his concern, this was in the 1950s, of in the, in the preaching, the pulpit, a very, he called it a low view of God, where it was more man-centered, uh, kind of self-help, pop psychology, and the difference was a high view of God, would, the language would be a whole lot more about God. What's your take on you know, I don't want us to be judgmental at all, but just you know, to a realistic view on um, the condition of the pulpit today, the church 
pastoral oh. pulpit of, uh, of this idea of, do you think there's a strong presentation of, of a, a holy, mighty, glorious, powerful, wonderful, spectacular God, you know, transcendent, uh, eminent, infinite, or is it more, do you think uh, the problem is more common, uh, come, come and get your, how to prosper a little bit more, how to get a little bit better life? Well, we're living in a day when preaching is not given much respect. Hmm. Um, uh, you take most charismatic churches, as I preach all over the world, or did till this coronavirus, and nearly wherever I go, they give more time for worship than they do the preaching. Right. They do. And that in itself tells you a lot. And you wonder why, uh, you know, charismatic movement, you know, might be a thousand miles wide, but one, one inch deep, because they just, they don't know what they believe. And that is what worries me about charismatics and Pentecostals. They, they're not theologically minded. And um, so were you, were you going to ask me about Tozer? I'm not sure. What, uh, yeah, what we, we, I was just saying we were reading Tozer's book and he talked, he was, his concern was the low view uh, it, it, from the preacher himself wasn't preaching like a high view of God. He was saying he was preaching more, more about yeah. man's problems. And I just wondered if you thought that was still happening today. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You see nearly everybody today, Gary, they want to know what's in it for me. Yeah. We live in the me generation. I don't know of anybody who asks what's in it for God. Wow. You see, we're not God centered at all. Uh, and so we preach, what will they think? How well will this go down with them? And you, you, because you know your people, they're wanting something that's going to make them feel good. They, that's what they're really coming. I want to feel good from this. And um, that's, that's the problem. We are thinking more about making them happy. And don't ask, will they think more of God? And that's the best way I know to put it. Yeah, that's powerful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> In uh, in your years of ministry, you know, you 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 were, I don't know if if you, um, R.T. Um, when you were at Westminster Chapel, was was uh, Martin Lloyd Jones and 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 those guys still there at the time or, or around? Or uh, and did you get to know them and hear about preaching from them at all? Well, Lloyd Jones himself, uh, he he and I were like father and son. I first met him in 1963, and got and had him sign my book, uh, his book. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, and I never thought I'd see him again. And then uh, uh, 1973, uh, we go to England, and I'm accepted to study at Oxford. So while I'm when I go to England, I get in touch with him. I had written letters to him across the Atlantic several times, and so he came to see us in Headington, uh, Oxford. That's a little suburb of Oxford, Headington. He and his wife and uh, Went to Shakespeare plays together, uh, hmm. and I was past a little church in uh, Oxfordshire, and he preached for me. Uh, and uh, he always saw me as a future professor. That's the way he saw me. A lot of people think that he is the one that recommended me to Westminster Chapel. It's not the way it was at all. Um, a friend who used to come to hear me preach in my church in North Oxfordshire, told them at Westminster Chapel, have you thought of having R.T. Kendall? And uh, they'd never heard of me. So they called Dr. Lloyd-Jones and said, uh, we're told we should have an R.T. Kendall. This is when they were without a minister. They had three years. There was no minister there. Mm -hmm. So they asked Dr. Lloyd-Jones, what do you know about R.T. Kendall? His reply was, this is what they told me. He said, have him. Theologian, you know, but have him. <laughs> Those were very words. Well, they, they had me. Well, wow. at the end of the day, the 12 deacons asked me to stay for six months. So Lloyd Jones called me the next day. He said, what on earth did you do yesterday? Because he, he didn't hear me. I said, well, I just preached. He said, so he and his wife drove to see us to persuade us to stay for six months. But he still had never heard me preach. And then when I did agree to stay for six months, he came in and sat on the 
in the back row behind a pillar. So I couldn't see him. And um, he called me that night. And here again, verbatim, he said, you're a born preacher. Your place is not in the university. Your place is in the pulpit. Mm. And he told that to everybody. And that word went around. So he, he often said, I alone put you there. Well, that's true. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. No, it, was, it wasn't him who introduced me. He just knew who I was and said, well, have him. And then after they liked me, then, and he heard me, he said, well, there's your man. And he always, he regarded me as, as his successor and said that if, if he had a mantle, I had it. And that's mm -hmm. the way it was. Beautiful. Uh, Camel Morgan died in 1945. Okay. Yeah. That was, that was so, before your time. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, um, well, I'll tell you something funny. Lloyd Jones and Mrs. Lloyd Jones, they said it two or three times said, I'm the nearest to Camel Morgan of anybody they ever met. Mm. Now, but wait a minute. They didn't mean it as a compliment. Oh, no. <laughs> they just said I had his personality. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> it made me feel good. But yeah, I, because he, that he told me later, he would make comments, you know, that are very negative. And when I realized how much he would say thing negative things i knew not to take it too seriously did the did the older people that when you first started going to uh, preaching at westminster chapel the older people there that had sat under g campbell morgan's ministry did they talk much about his preaching at all or no you know what only maybe under five people okay. but the, when i got there yeah uh, our uh, main deacon ernest Padden, he heard campbell morgan preach uh and he was the only living person uh, under my ministry that remembered Campbell Morgan. Mm. Uh, uh, anyway. Well, that's, that's, that's quite a history there. And um, if it would, would you, you know, like a lot of young pastors are, are learning from you about pastoring and preaching, like my, my, my friend Tim, for instance, uh, what, what do you feel is the single most important takeaway you got from uh, um, uh, Lloyd Jones uh, oh. about preaching. Well, I I think I'm the luckiest man in the history of the Christian Church. And I'll tell you why I say it, and when I finish, you'll say I agree with you, RT. You will agree with this. I have an Oxford education, and Lloyd Jones as my mentor for four years. Every week, I sat at his feet from 1977 to 1981, the year he died. He vetted nearly every sermon I preached. I would go through all the notes. That I'm going to say this. And he'd just go, mm, mm, no, 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 leave that out. No, no, that's no good. You know, that, that at, you know, wait, no, say that next week, because next week you're going to come to that subject. Don't, don't say it now. He just would give me all kinds of tips. And for me to have that kind of instruction, I don't know of anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine sitting under Spurgeon. Right. Uh, that's what I had yeah. uh, with Lloyd Jones. Everybody would say he's the greatest preacher since Spurgeon. Some would say he's better than Spurgeon. Who, who knows whether that's true? You got to remember also, people don't realize this. Lloyd Jones was a, a Welsh orator. He he could speak on politics with such clarity and interest and he he was riveting the way he would speak so he had uh, heard you use the phrase common grace about 20 minutes ago well he was gifted with special grace in nature that's what calvin called it uh where mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with whether you're saved or even the saving work of the holy spirit it's just a gift lloyd jones had that yeah. and he had an intellect that exceeded um Anybody, mm. I think anybody would meet. Uh, met. He was, you know, most people are either, they excel in arts or sciences. He excelled in both. Mm. He got 100 out of 100 on science and 100 out of 100 on arts, literature. That's, that's how bright he was. Yeah. And you, you know, too, don't you, that he was a medical doctor. 
I did not know that, no. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. They call him the doctor because he, he has an MD. He oh. doesn't even have a theological degree. He never went to Bible college. Oh. No. No. I, no. I had no idea. I read his books, but or some of his books, but did not know that. He, is, he was the assistant to Lord Horder, who was the king's heart physician. And if Lloyd-Jones had not gone into ministry, he'd have become the king's physician. My goodness. Wow. Yeah. He's a skilled man. If, um, if a young uh, pastor were to ask you, um, say you meet, you know, say you're, you're preaching and you get down out of the pulpit and a young preacher walks up to you and says, you know, what's the most important thing you could, you know, you have five minutes with him or less. What's the one thing you'd want to make sure he knew about preaching? Is there one thing above any other thing in your book that you sort of, sort of say is in your, not your book, but, you know, in your own understanding? Of the, the okay, right now, I would never, ever, ever, ever write a book on preaching. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to be humble. I, w- I wouldn't know what to say. Hmm. I'll tell you, have you ever heard of Richard Vermbrand? Yes. <laughs> you yeah. have? Yeah, they were okay. uh, from Romania. Is it, I yeah. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, I had the privilege of meeting him when I was a seminary student in Louisville, Kentucky, back in 1971. And I had lunch with him and his wife. And I said, Well, I am so pleased to meet you. And here's what he said to me Young man, spend more time talking to God about men than talking to men about God. (laughs) Mm. Now, that's his word. Well, I'll just tell you right now, I took that seriously. And I would say the key is how much time you spend alone with God. Mm. You could read a thousand books on sermons and get nowhere. And so it all comes from your relationship with God. Now, that's assuming you have a preaching gift. You know, not all have it. Um, so if I had five minutes, uh, I would just repeat what Vern Braun said to me. That's good. I don't yeah. think I can do better than that. No, no, that, that, that helps. Yeah. Getting alone with God and, uh, getting Spend more time talking yeah. to God about men than mm. talking to men about God. Oh, God. Yeah. That's, that's, <clears throat> you know, I asked you about your, your learning from Martin Lloyd Jones and others. You know, I, I learned from my father about, about preaching and that's what he would say to me too. It's like, it's, it all comes from the secret closet. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, yeah, you gotta be gifted and you gotta have passion and a call on your life. But if he said most men, you know, waste time in administration and all kinds of others, other stuff and, and never, you know, really get a, you know, get that fire from God. That's, and that's, that's one of the things that uh, he tried to teach me. And the last, about the last five or six years of his life, we traveled together we were in about 72 different countries doing pastors conferences. And that was that time where he finally, up to that point, he was just always pat me on the back and say, you're doing a good job. Uh, but the last five years, I, I think he knew his time was a little bit shorter and uh, he got real integral and said like, okay, do this and don't do that and avoid that. And sometimes I'd come after the, out of the pulpit and he'd say, you know, you said this and it kind of made, it kind of made your point less powerful. And if you had left that out, you know, sometimes what you cut out is better than what you put in. And, uh, so it's, it's it's great to have, and that's why we wanted to do this series as well, is because you know you had that with Martin Lloyd Jones, I had that with my father. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, that's why I say I don't think I'm the luckiest man. I don't know of anybody, any human being, in two thousand years, that could you know have could say these two things. It's right. So I'm without excuse if I don't produce something. Yeah. Well, you you leave, leave behind. You do, you have, and you are, and more to come. Actually, uh, I'm getting off subject here a little bit, but uh, I was just looking at your website, and you're, you're going to be at our uh, good friend's church there in New York City uh, on a pretty regular basis, Times Square Church in New well, York. <laughs> I don't know about live, but... He's going to have me once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see if he invites me back. Uh, he told me He told me different. He told me he was planning on having you... Uh, up there monthly. I don't know if he told you that part or not yet. Well, but. yeah, he told me that. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you're going up there. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm real happy for him and, and for you too. I think you're gonna like it up there. It's a good, it's a good, a good church. Once the people get back there, you'll see a, you know, hundred and something different nationalities all together. And I know you had that at, uh, you had that at Kensington uh, uh, Temple where you pastored after Westminster Chapel, right? Uh, racially. Well, I was going to say that. 
Okay. Well, first of all, Westminster Chapel. When I first went, it was a white middle-class church with, you know, a handful of Afro, well, they don't call them Afro-Americans over there, uh, Nigerians or Kenyans, right. Right. Uh, not many. But when I left, there were 26 nationalities that attended. Beautiful. Then the pastor of Kensington Temple, his name is Colin Dyer. He and I became, were friends the whole time I was Westminster. We prayed for each other every day, but I never preached there. I, because I'm always in my own pulpit. But when we retired, uh, Colin says, well, now we can have you. And so I would go there once or twice a year. And then he said, why don't you just come and live here for six months? So for the last seven years, uh, we lived in an apartment there in Notting Hill Gate. And um, so I preached. I was kind of like on the staff. Okay. Preached uh, three or four times a month for six months for the last seven years and mm -hmm. then we were there until march of this year and and then the virus hit and we just got out of town as soon as we could yeah yeah that's, um the the, la the last question i have for you is where would you place uh if uh, if you were to set priorities for a pastor um counseling uh the different duties of a pastor where would you place preaching on the list of priorities uh, for for a, a pastor? Well, it depends on his gift. Mm -hmm. If he's if he is the pastor, he's going to have to be the preacher as well. But if it's a church big enough to have a staff, uh, I I don't know how to answer that. I honestly, don't know. Uh, at Westminster Chapel, uh, it was in a Camel Morgan, according to Lloyd Jones. G. Campbell Morgan always called it a preaching center. He said, Westminster Chapel is not a church. Hmm. It's a preaching center. And Lloyd-Jones, uh, you could tell, kind of agreed with that, but he made it more of a church. They would take their meals on Sundays and bring people, hmm. they'd bring their food. And then when I was there, I would say even more so a church. So it sounded like you, you balance your priorities, it sounds like, between pastoral care and uh, community fellowship and, and preaching as well? Well, you see, I've never been in a church large enough to have a big staff. Westminster Chapel, I was it. Hmm. In fact, Lloyd-Jones would call it a benign dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> and I preached four times a week, every one of them original sermons. And uh, you, you got six weeks off in the summer, vacation. And you did nothing but prepare and preach, prepare and preach. I'd start preparing on a Monday morning, and by uh, Saturday afternoon, I'd be ready for Sunday morning, Sunday night. In the meantime, I'd have to preach on a Friday night and a Thursday lunchtime. Uh, that's what I did. So I was the preacher. And the only time we had an, a, a guest was uh, when I was on vacation. Okay. Uh, there was an exception. Have you ever heard of Billy Graham? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did have him preach for me while I was there. But uh, how did he do? Did he do okay? Did he keep the keep the, well, keep the fire I, burning? I, I, I graded him, and he asked. He called me the next <laughs> day. How did I do, RT? No, no. no. Uh, He's the only time. Well, you ever heard of Arthur Blessed? Yeah. Well, he was an exception too. Okay. Arthur Blessed filled the chapel. I never did. Hmm. Uh, by the way, never. neither did Lloyd-Jones. Hmm. He didn't feel it either. Hmm. Uh, Camel Morgan did on Friday nights, but not on Sundays. Wow. Those are, those are separate stories, hmm. if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, but I had uh, Arthur Blessed uh, preach for me six Sundays in a row, and he turned us upside down. Best decision I made in 25 years to have Arthur Blessed. Hmm. Uh, but Billy Graham preached for me on a Sunday night in May 1984. And uh, I think probably 80 people came forward, a place with 2,000 there. 80 people came forward for salvation. Mm -hmm. And it's a great night. Beautiful. Wonderful night. Wow. I love that. Um, would, would you, um, if you could if you go back in time and do anything different with your preaching, uh, would, what would, you, would you like to do anything differently? Or would you be about the same? I wrote a book called uh, In Pursuit of His Glory, 
based on my 25 years at Westminster Chapel. And the last chapter was entitled, If I Could Turn the Clock Back. Mm. And uh, I forget now all I said, but it includes things like this. What I would do differently, what, I'd, what I would do more of, or what I'd do less of. Yeah. If I turn the clock back first, I would put my family first. Mm. Second, uh, I would have the courage to be myself. I, I think for a long time I was afraid they wouldn't like me if, if I was really myself. Mm. Uh, the thing I would do the same, expository preaching, because that's all, that's, that's all I do. I couldn't, okay. I couldn't do anything else if I tried. That's, that's me. Uh, I, I think I said, if I could, you know, I would give a little more attention to worship than I did, because all we did was sing uh, hymns and, and pray and read the Bible and, and then preaching. I, I think I would give more attention to worship, uh, but not as much as they're doing nowadays in right, typical right. charismatic churches. That's the overdo it. Uh, Trying to think what else I said. I'd, if I'd have known you were going to ask me that, I'd have this book ready. No, that's a great answer. That, that helps to know. Just I, I think, that, you know, that, uh, and I agree with you. The family, a lot, a lot of people that are pastors or preachers uh, spend so much time in, in sermon preparation. That's good. And in uh, counseling in the church, that's good. But, you know, sometimes their family's neglected. And Well, you mentioned counseling. I would do counseling if people would make an appointment and come to the church to the pastor's study. And uh, I would talk to people in the in the vestry. If if you grew up in a denomination or a a theological um, doctrinal view, and you've shifted your view, but your church, your following, so to speak, they are still of the old. I, and I remember reading from you. You you grew up more in like an Armenian, and then you, when you were twenty, you became a Calvinist. Is that correct? Correct. Was that so? Uh, would you recommend? I, I don't know how to form this question very well. That's why I was going to ask you later. I didn't have. I don't have my words to. Uh, well, I, I think it's a good one. W- yeah. When do you? I, I was right. Public. It's, yeah. You to say it now. I, I, <laughs> I have a feeling that this would be probably the most interesting question you've asked all day. Okay. <laughs> you, you pushed me, man. You pushed me. Well, don't you can, you can always edit this. And yeah, no, no, let's, let's go with it. So, so, you know, I, I have um, a pretty good, good number of people that get our newsletter. You know, my father started it and I've been following. So maybe like, you know, 250,000 people every, every, um, how many? About 250,000 every 250,000? month. 250,000? Yeah, on a monthly. It's a written sermon newsletter. Oh, and my so goodness. I've been, and so I, my question is if, if I have a, like you had, a, a change in doctrinal stance, do you take the risk of make, going public with that? Or do you just kind of be quiet about it so that you don't hurt the people that have the other view? You obviously chose to go public because you had to, right? Because it was just such a strong conviction. Well, it's it's uh, not as simple as that. Okay. First of all, it's while I was at Trevecca Nazarene College, and I was also a pastor of a church. I was a student pastor, and I would preach there on weekends. Uh, I'll try to keep this short because I don't know how much time, take your time. you really, really want me to take. Uh, I might have told this on a previous interview. I don't remember. But anyway, here's the story. One Monday morning, dr- driving in my car from my church down in the mountains of Tennessee back to Nashville, I had what I would call a Damascus Road experience. It was not my conversion. It was when I was baptized with the Spirit. That's the best way to put it. At that time, I didn't know what to call it. But it was an amazing experience where the person of Jesus was more real to me than you are right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it was like I could touch him. I could tell you what he looked like. I saw his face. I entered into a rest the experience went on for an hour, a peace that I didn't know you could have in this world that changed my theology in hours. Before the day was over, I believed in predestination, once saved, always saved. And I told my professor this at Trevecca. He said, you're going off into Calvinism. I said, what's that? <laughs> well, he said, well, we don't believe that. 
Oh, I said, then we're wrong. <laughs> he said, please, R.T., don't leave the church. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to leave the church. I said, well, look, look I read Romans 9, 15. God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I said, you tell me what that means. Oh, he said, uh, give me some time on that. Mm. That was, you know, 60 years ago. He never did sort that one out. <laughs> the point is, that was when I was a Nazarene. I eventually, it didn't happen overnight, but over a year or two, I've made my way into a Baptist church and eventually became Southern Baptist. And... Um, uh, then went to Southern Baptist Seminary and then to Oxford. And then by the time I am invited to preach at Westminster Chapel, my theology is well settled. And so I didn't have any change of theology while I was at Westminster Chapel. Yeah. So it didn't happen then. You see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. That's why I said it's, it, it's not easy to say. Right. So this experience happened when I was 19. I go to Westminster Chapel when I'm, 40. That's 21 years later. In the meantime, I, I was all over the place. Mm. I didn't know what denomination I was going to end up in. I tried Presbyterian. I tried Reformed. I tried Southern Baptist. Uh, Nazarenes wouldn't want me. Uh, <laughs> they, they respected me. In fact, I've got a DD from Trebekah. They mm. respect me because they know how all this happened. Uh, but by the time I went to Westminster, I was a solid Calvinist. Now, what was uh, not a change in me, people think it was, but after Arthur Blessed came, I had the courage, I'm ashamed to say I didn't have before, but after Arthur came, he started giving an open invitation for people to come forward, mm -hmm. which Lloyd-Jones never did. And Lloyd-Jones uh, was afraid of competing with the Holy Spirit. And you shouldn't, you know, do anything. Well, after Arthur left, I kept up the invitation, but I was very careful mm -hmm. how I did it. I, I didn't say, come forward to be saved. I say, here's the prayer I want you to pray. If you can pray this prayer, are you ashamed of it? And share it with us. Mm -hmm. And I'd have them come forward. Well, I got criticized still, even though it's what I would call a Calvinistic altar call. Right. And there's no doubt. No one accused me of pressuring people or pushing or singing 10 more verses of just as I am or almost persuaded or tell mother I'll be there. We didn't do that. We just would sing a hymn and it was it. But I still got criticized for it. So uh, those were hard days at Westminster Chapel because I was perceived as differing with the doctor. We never did. It's not mm -hmm. true. Yeah. But people thought that because I gave this invitation. So any change came, wasn't so much theological as it was Arthur did what he did and the church just was so excited. We began to witness out on the streets and uh, we did start singing choruses and not only, we'd do both. Uh, so that was an upheaval in the chapel. You would do well uh, to get my book In Pursuit of His Glory because I think you'd like it. I will. Yeah, you'd like it. Write that down in pursuit. Good. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's. Um, I think I'm yeah. sure Tim's read that. Yeah, um, I was talking to. I don't know if you know him or not. You may have crossed paths with uh, Dr. Sam Storms uh, from Oklahoma. You know, we have never met. Okay. All right. We've never met, but I've endorsed two or three of his books, okay. and I think he has mine. Yeah. I, the reason I brought him up was uh, he was telling me in a conversation that. Um, well, maybe you know, 15 years or so into his pastorate, he um, changed his view after studying the scripture on the on the on the uh, end times type stuff, like uh, you know pre-trib or post-trib or a millennial. So he changed, and then he told his church about it, and his church kind of nicely asked him to leave. Uh, and he thought it was kind of strange because it was he didn't feel like that was a central doctrine, yeah. uh, but he preached on it. And so I I just was wondering your advice. You know, like for me, I grew up in a very like uh, not so much my parents, but my grandparents, uh, a very strict Pentecostal. So if you sinned uh, at school on Monday, you lost your salvation. You had to get saved again. And then you, if you sinned on Tuesday, you got to get saved. You know, and, and my thought as a kid was you couldn't get saved until Sunday because you had to come at the altar call. And so I was in fear all week, like, Jesus, don't come back now because I got to wait till Sunday to get saved again. And then Monday I'd sin again. So, so my shift was away from 
that fearful thing into security of salvation, uh, become much more, I don't know if I'm a Calvinist, but I'm a much more of a reformed, uh, or a reformed theology, but I've never really been public about it until just now because you made me say this <laughs> live instead of afterwards. But, uh, you know, I, the, I hope I don't get you in trouble. No, no, not at all. And I'm not afraid of that. I just, I don't, I don't want to hurt people, you know, in the sense of, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, uh, when we have a, th- uh, you know, I, I'm so glad yours was early, but you know, mine came a little bit later in life yeah. and I already sort of already had somewhat of a, you know, we, we have a, a probably a larger Pentecostal Armenian following, I would say. Uh, but yeah, so I'm kind of getting more and more to the point in my older age of wanting to just kind of say it like it is and let the chips fall where they might. And, but, but at the same time, I don't want to, you know, kind of like Sam Storm said, like, you know, don't want to unnecessarily rock the boat if you don't have to, but, but I, I like what you're saying though. I'll, I'll get that book. I think that'll help a lot. I think it's the way you uh, spoon feed them and just, if you take your church with you yeah. and you say, I'm coming into understanding some things, I want you all to pray with me that I don't mess up. I don't get it wrong and yeah. let them feel like they're part of it. And you say, I'm seeing this in the Bible. This seems to me, this is saying this. And um, that's the way I would advise people. And also my teaching of total forgiveness, it's because I really did not only believe it, but I, I lived it. And that way I was able to hold my church pretty much together in the changes because of Arthur Blessed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it wasn't easy because I still had six of the 12 deacons turn against me. And wow. <laughs> worst trial of my life. But yeah. still, uh, we, we, we survived and I stayed 25 years. Mm, beautiful. Wow, that's good news. Well, thanks for your wisdom and your advice. I'm sure you enjoyed that interview with R.T. Kendall. What a great man of God and what a great preacher he has been through the past several decades, preaching quite often now at Times Square Church in New York City and for us here at World Challenge and also for our conferences. Uh, we're launching some new conferences um, called Fire in Our Bones. It's a desire to see, as Jeremiah 29 talks about, uh, when the condition of the nation was in decay and backslidden, uh, he was ready to give up, but then he decided... Uh, I can't quit. I got a fire in, in my bones. I can't shut up. I have to preach this. And so we're emphasizing particularly preachers, but not just preachers, for, but for church members who care about what is happening in our pulpits today, what's happening in our churches today, because that is vital to what's happening in our nation today. So we have these pastors conferences, these uh, teachings now that we're doing from this podcast, or we're calling a fire in our bones as well, just to help see a revival among our churches, and a spiritual awakening in our nation. Each week, this podcast reaches thousands of listeners. This critical work is made possible by the generous contributions of individuals like you who believe in the mission of World Challenge. Thank you for listening and supporting. World Challenge, transforming lives through the message and mission of Jesus Christ. Visit us online at worldchallenge.org.